He is the author of Iberian Moorings, Moorings and Andalus, Seafaring and the Troops of Expansionism by University Press of Pennsylvania, 2022, and Power and Portrayal Representation of Muslims and Jews in Islamic Spain by Princeton University Press. Please welcome Ross Brown. Thank you very much, Erlen. And uh, I always begin this podcast by asking, how did you come across studying Al-Andalus, or of course, better known as Islamic Spain? Well, I actually study it as part of the entire uh, Islamic Mediterranean during the Middle Ages. Um, it's true that most of my research involves uh, Muslims, Christians, and Jews in medieval Iberia, but I see it as part of a larger uh, story, uh, which is the way in which these three uh, confessional communities interacted throughout the entire southern Mediterranean, all the way to the Levant uh, during the Middle Ages, with Iberia, Al-Andalus, which we also call Islamic Spain, being the westernmost place where this was happening. And I'm sure this will come up in the podcast as well, but what is fascinating, and you said this before, that and again, I re keep repeating this in the episodes that we have about is Islamic history, where they had this toleration that I don't believe existed as much in Europe at the time. And in I believe it was the Fatimid Caliphate at the time, where you could see both Jews, Christian, a Christian, and a Islamic scholar argue without you know being head head to head against each other, which is quite fascinating. But yeah, like we said, that it's also the what was toleration at right. the time it's because it wasn't what is looked at toleration today so you're describing the fatimid caliphate in egypt and in syro palestine at the turn of the sec into the turn of the second millennium and that was certainly true there it was also true in baghdad in the abbasid caliphate that among the most educated most cosmopolitan and sophisticated Muslims, Christians, and Jews, there was a sense that uh, things that elsewhere at other times and places would be discussed with a, a lot of hostility and animosity, that when reason uh, was the ground rule for engaged debate discussion among like-minded intellectuals, that things could be conducted in a, uh, in a tolerant uh, atmosphere. And that was true in Islamic Spain, it was true in Fatimid uh, Cairo, it was true in Abbasid Baghdad. And that's uh, that. This is what we're going to drop into Islamic Spain in a second. But I just want to say I, I think that's really unique for the Islamic world that this could happen in all well, almost a peaceful manner at least. Well, yes, and this is uh, the way in which we talk about this is a matter of tremendous scholarly debate today. Um, some people have posited, let's just focus for the moment, I mean, since I'm here to talk about Al-Andalus Islamic Spain, yeah. that the choices are either absolute hatred, hostility, yeah. uh, disagreement, contention all the time, or on the other extreme, interfaith utopia during the Middle Ages. And both of those are a complete exaggeration. Um, and so I prefer to use the, the, the term tolerance because mm. for a variety of reasons, very complex reasons, uh, Al-Andalus Islamic Spain uh, saw its share of tensions between these religious communities, but by and large, and certainly compared to medieval Europe, Christendom, uh, this was a society of relative tolerance for the Middle Ages. Um, and it, it does us no good to sort of portray mm. either of those two extremes. Mm. But we have a lot of scholarly debate today that wants to say, no, you know, the getting along was exaggerated and it was hostility from A to Z or... Mm. There wasn't any hostility at all or intercommunal tension. Both of those are exaggerations. And again, I do want to, I'm sorry for not getting into Al-Andalus just yet, but I do, you do have exceptions in Europe as well. You do have the British Anglo-Saxon scholar, Ad Adelard, I believe. I'd probably say his name, but he 
he learned, but then went on a crusade to learn from the Arabs instead of fighting them. But he came. With, I don't remember how the quote goes, but it said something like, "It's what we haven't learned from the Arabs," or something in line. I think it was. So in the you know early in the you know the second millennium, you do have at European universities and various Christian scholars interested in learning Arabic, in translating the Quran to understand something about Islam, but mostly for polemical purposes and mostly because they're very aware that in Sicily, which is also mm. under Islamic yeah. control for nearly two centuries, and Al-Andalus, which is under uh, either complete or partial Islamic control, from the 8th century all the way to the end of the 15th mm -hmm. century, that Islam is a force to be reckoned with and also to stave off conversions. Mm -hmm. um, this is probably also exaggerated, the fear of conversions. And it yields our earliest uh, evidence of Islamophobia, I guess, mm -hmm. a lot of which has been picked up today mm -hmm. in, in the 21st century. So before going to the conquest itself, I want to talk about what was, because as you know, the as Hispania or Spain was part of the Roman Empire for quite a long time. Yes. So as the Romans leave and the, before the Maya conquest, what was the state of Spain like to understand? I, mean, I feel like we have to talk about this before, to understand how they managed yeah. to su successfully so, um, conquer Spain. Before the Muslims arrived uh, and began the conquest in 711, uh, for nearly two centuries, um, the Hispano-Roman population, those left over from the, the Roman Empire, uh, ha have become our citizens, not citizens, our residents of uh, the Visigothic kingdom. The Visigoths came two centuries before the Muslims. We're not talking about the Goths that we think about today, by the way. Excuse me? We are not talking about the gods that you think about today, by the way. There's a different right. kind of gods. Right. So, uh, and uh, they didn't convert to Catholicism until the 5th century. Um, um, and um, so you have a Hispano-Roman population ruled over by foreigners mm -hmm. who, who, over the course of generations, become acclimatized to Iberia. We can talk about the land in geographic terms and simply call it Visigothic Iberia. It is not yet what we would call Spain, the name of a modern nation state. So we do, you know, the, the population is speaking a version of romance, which eventually gives way to Spanish, but much later on. Um, and uh, th those who prefer to call it Visigothic Spain uh, or that it was always Spain, this has a historical, historiographical edge to it. They want to be able to claim that there always was such a thing as Spain. But I mean, the was, Romans, they called it Hispania, though, didn't they? H Hispania is fine uh, because that's the Roman name of the province. Uh, and that's why I called... Uh, the people living there when the Visigoths came, Hispano-Roman. Um, there's no problem with that. That's historically accurate. But that's not the same thing as the name of a nation state, mm -hmm. which we call Spain. Um, and that certainly was not the case when the Muslims came in 711, uh, which is, I think, what we principally want to talk about. Something that I want, we, we mentioned this in the anglo saxon episode, because and I believe you sort of answered this, but, but the, the state of Britain when the Romans left, it was bad. And while we, Mark Morris talked about how they kind of didn't, don't call it a dark age anymore, you can kind of see why they call it a dark age after the Romans left Britain. But was it kind of the same state with Spain after the Romans left? Was it different because it, because it was on the mainland? Um. So... We don't know a whole lot about this. We have Visigothic legislation. We have some literary texts. Um, there were, you know, sort of major cities, but most of the folk are living off the land. Um, the Hispano-Roman population is 
dispersed throughout the peninsula and mostly living off the land. So it's not a wealthy country. There is a Visigothic nobility, um, but it collapses almost immediately upon the arrival of uh, the Muslims in 711. So how strong this state was is a kind of open question. There were internecine rivalries, which led to its weakness. But there's also this question of how wedded to uh, the Visigothic monarchy the Hispano-Roman population was. These are open questions. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with the early 8th century is that we do not have a single eyewitness account of the arrival of the Muslims, mm -hmm. uh, Arabs and Berbers. Arabs from the heartland of the Middle East who moved across mm -hmm. North Africa, picked up uh, Berbers, uh, many converted to Islam, others probably with a very rudimentary understanding of Islam, mm -hmm. but participating in this army, uh, an army of conquest that met with insufficient resistance to stop it. And that included in, in Iberia leading to the conquest um, and um, then you have uh, a generation of pacifying the country, but at, and Al-Andalus now, the Arabic word for Iberia or Islamic Spain, and ruling as a small minority over a very large Hispano-Roman Catholic population um, that with, with some frictions, uh, in the countryside, less so in the larger cities, uh, and with or without the cooperation and assistance of a relatively small Jewish population that lived alongside the Hispano-Romans uh, as a subject people. Judaism was out outlawed by the Visigoths in the sixth century, end of the, yeah, end of the sixth century, and so we have some texts that talk about, they're all from a slightly later time, but talk about the Jews assisting the Muslims in the conquest and pacification of what became Al-Andalus. And this became one of the seeds of the, this memory, whether it actually happened or not, became one of the seeds of the idea that the Jews are in league with the Muslims, um, that the Jews uh, uniquely benefit because in Visigothic Spain, they were the principal religious minority in the country. There weren't any Muslims living there. Mm -hmm. Suddenly when the Muslims come now, the Jews as well as the Catholic Hispano-Romans are both under minority status, mm -hmm. even though a majority of people living in the land are still Hispano-Roman Catholics. But now the Jews are on an equal footing mm -hmm with the Hispano-Romans under the aegis of an Islamic empire. Mm -hmm. So everything gets turned topsy-turvy during that period in terms of the social, political, as well as religious fabric of the country. Mm -hmm. Now, from what we know in terms of what's called the conversion curve in Islamic, um, the study of Islamic history, uh, a majority of the population in Al-Andalus, in Islamic Spain, is not itself Muslim till probably early in the middle of the 10th century. So it takes 200 years, approximately, for the population of the land to achieve even 50% of it being Muslim. 200 years after, it already becomes part of the Islamic empire. Uh, or a distant outpost of the Islamic Empire, centered by that time in in Baghdad. Hmm. Um, but but and, the the Umayyads, they were, as you know, they were rather hesitant in converting, right? Because that was tax revenue for the Umayyad caliphates. That right. So I see you've done your your history of Islamic uh, uh, taxation policy since non-Muslims. Under Islam, and this was not new to Islam. This was true both in the Byzantine Empire and in the Sasanian Empire that Islam inherited in the East. That uh, minorities were subject to a harsher uh, taxation scheme, so there was a disincentive 
uh, to uh, rush to convert, to forcibly convert people, uh, monotheists. And this is the heart of, in terms of Islamic law, it's already uh, present in, in legislation in the Quran, that non-Muslims who are monotheists are protected subjects, protected peoples under Islam. They are tolerated. They have certain rights, but not the same rights as Muslims. But they, they are second-rate citizens, eventually. They have to pay a special tax. Mm -hmm. So uh, for, as far as the Islamic State was concerned, there was a, an incentive not to forcibly convert. And by and large, uh, Jews and Christians were never forcibly converted during this period. We have some instances of that later on, ironically, in North Africa and Spain, but this is many, many centuries later. Um, and so conversion takes place uh, through natural processes. People either interested in becoming Muslims, people who think Islam so closely resembles Christianity or Judaism that there's no reason not to convert, uh, and then people uh, increasingly, because Islam appears powerful and successful, uh, people who convert because out of uh, convenience and socioeconomic incentive or people looking to uh, advance themselves in Islamic society. So we have a very complex, very dynamic social, political, uh, religious situation all throughout uh, both the central lands of Islam and for our purposes, the Western lands of Islam. No, I don't know. You don't really want to. I mean, tell us a little briefly about this before we started recording. And I know you don't really want to talk too much about it, but and with like, the Battle of Tours, of course, we, it's kind of the elephant in the room here. And Gibbon, of course, explains that, that he believes if they won, there would have been Muslims in Britain right now, perhaps, or the fate of Europe would be changed forever. But is that the case? Do you think they would have grown merciless, in quotation, mercilessly over Europe? I, I don't think that could ever have happened. Of course, we, we can't uh, always know uh, about things that didn't happen as opposed to endeavoring to interrogate the things that we think happened or that were recorded as having happened. But um, since the Muslims in Iberia were such a minority of the population, perhaps relying on some Jewish assistance in pacifying towns and cities um, and trying to control the countryside where there weren't Jews and Muslims weren't yet living, but the small numbers involved in uh, the conquest tell us that there was no way that the Muslims could have uh, left the continent and gone, say, to, to England, and probably absolutely impossible to continue to march had they been successful at Tours and, and gone across uh, the Pyrenees, Pyrenees into, uh, into, into what we call France. Uh, the, the numbers simply weren't there. So, uh, and the task of pacifying this country where Muslims were such a tiny minority in the eighth century left them with plenty to do. So um, I, I, I think Gibbon and those who have followed him, I think this is a kind of earliest Islamophobia in mm. the writing of, of history. Um, I, I just, I, I, I think, you know, it, it's, it, it's not to be, it's not believable. Of course, Arabic would was the the lingua franca in the Arabic world, and it would be so in Islamic Spain as well. But how long time, as we discussed, it was our Islam is Muslims were the minority. So how long time would it become the right. lingua franca in? So this is a great Al question because we talk about two processes. They're interconnected, but they're also discrete. One process is the process of Islamization of the Hispano-Iberian population, which was dynamic and it was dramatic, but relatively slow in terms of taking 200 years for the number of Muslims to reach say 50% of the overall population. Yeah. 
Um, Arabization happens much more quickly for a bunch of reasons. Arabization happens quickly because it's the language of the administration and it becomes the language of commerce. So especially in the cities, less so in the countryside where you don't have a need for it, but in the cities, in Cordoba, in Sevilla, in Granada, in Zaragoza, in Valencia, in all of these major, major cities where Islam becomes the ruling authority and the government begins to mint coins with Arabic. Um, uh, and uh, commerce is then conducted in Arabic and diplomacy is conducted in Arabic and uh, everyday commercial interactions are conducted in Arabic. There's a need for people in, in of the middle classes uh, and the lower middle classes to say nothing of the upper classes in the great cities to uh, begin to uh, acquire some Arabic. Now, this turns out to be easier for the Jewish population because although they're not speakers of Hebrew, mm -hmm. they, uh, they at least know some Hebrew and some Aramaic. And if they're educated, they know a lot of Hebrew and a lot of Aramaic. And those two lang Jewish languages are first cousins of Arabic. And so to look for that small ethnic and religious group to master Arabic is a much easier task than it is for the Hispano Roman Christian population. Um, and what we know is, again, the evidence is kind of indirect, um, but we have some texts from uh, the ninth century, the middle of the ninth century, in Cordoba, when uh, some important Christian writers writing in Latin, wanting to preserve Hispano Christian culture, uh, observe that young Christian boys of the learned classes aren't doing their Latin lessons. Why? Because they're all studying Arabic. Mm. Now, this is probably an exaggeration. But these, uh, these, uh, this writer uh, and uh, an important priest that he works with, um, his name is Paulus Alvarez, the writer, uh, is lamenting this Arabization. And uh, he laments that Christian young men are more interested in learning Arabic and Arabic poetry than in doing their Latin lessons. And this produces, this is evidence of a crisis in the, in the church under Islam there. Because if young men aren't doing their Latin lessons, they can't enter the priesthood. And if you don't have an active and uh, vital priesthood, then you can't offer Holy Communion. And so the whole edifice of the structure of the church collapses. You can't practice uh, uh, Roman Catholicism. Um, so this is indirect evidence that of the appeal of Arabic, not just the need to learn Arabic for commercial and administrative purposes, but also the appeal of Arabic, its cultural appeal, uh, Arabic poetry, Arabic learning. Uh, before we started recording, we were talking about how the scientific and philosophical learning that was taking place in Baghdad mm. in the ninth century uh, was already in the process of being transferred across North Africa to Islamic Spain mm. through the copying of books and uh, the purchasing of books. And because Muslims, the numbers of Muslims in Spain, and there were always during this period, some Muslims in the East and in, uh, let's say, Syro-Palestine and Egypt and North Africa, who were interested in uh, possibilities, uh, entrepreneurial possibilities uh, in the Islamic West and in uh, Islamic Spain. And so you have some, you have a, a migration at times. You also have people going in the other direction. And you always have learned Muslims in Al-Andalus going to the East on pilgrimage. 
to go to Mecca and Medina. Now, when they went to Mecca and Medina on Islamic pilgrimage, they also would typically stop in Cairo and maybe in Damascus, and maybe they would even go along all the way to Baghdad. Along the way, people of the learned classes would buy books. They would sit in on lessons of teachers because they were interested in uh, intellectual uh, pursuits. And so all of that knowledge for the people who would come back with books and learning was transferred from the Islamic East to Islamic Spain, where it also took deep root, um, usually within two generations or so after it was manifested in the East. This is how Greco-Roman learning, mostly Gre Greek learning, uh, uh, scientific and philosophic learning took deep root in the Islamic East and was transferred also to Islamic Spain where it took deep root as well. So the arts and sciences blossomed in this new society, which because of the natural fertility of Islamic Spain and the rise in Mediterranean trade under laissez-faire Islamic economic practices. So you have a society that is growing that whose political economy is expanding. Uh, Christians and Jews are invited to participate in economic activity without restriction. So earlier I'd mentioned that the Jews were persecuted under the Visigoths. Well, under, uh, under Islam, um, there, Islamic law and Islamic society has no problems with non-Muslims participating in economic freedom um, so long as they, you know, do not, uh, so as long as they do not defame the prophet, yeah. violate the sensibility of Muslims, they're free to engage in economic pursuits uh, and to uh, amass wealth. And, and, and so we see this as well under Spanish reconquest, and when they ban the Jews, where do they go? They go to the Ottoman empire because they are free to practice the religion and they're free to to do the work that they need you know so that, that you see this when they get banished they go again to the islamic world to profit in the 15th and 16th yeah. century exactly the same the same model um so um in a way you could say that everyone benefits and within you know two centuries this society is detached from the Abbasid Caliphate and feeling its oats and standing on its own. And so early, uh, you know, decades of the 10th century, uh, Islamic Spain becomes a its own caliphate. Between 711 and uh, the early 10th century, you have a session of emirs uh, and abbot. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure that what to, the, sorry for interrupting you identified there. Identified with the Umayyads, the first dynasty. Sorry, you felt, you felt out a little, little bit, but I'm sorry for interrupting you there. But I want to talk about this because, you know, as you know, the Umayyads, for, because they don't have the greatest government, and there's quite a few fitness or civil wars, as they do know their civil wars in the Umayyad Caliphate. And eventually they fall to the Abbasids, and... Uh, Abd al Rahman has managed to escape. So how is how does it end up in Cordoba and how does it manage to rule keep ruling in, in my of Spain? So he's he's a refugee from um from Abbasid uh destruction of the Umayyad house. Mm. And um he um uh, leaves the East and goes across North Africa, um, probably uh, because his mother was a Berber. He seems to develop ties with some Berbers in North Africa and arrives in Al-Andalus and um, with a sufficient following um, and a claim to some kind of authority because his family is of the larger clan of the prophet, mm. the Qureshi clan. Um, and um, this is sufficient to, to, and we presume his charisma. Um, again, we don't have eyewitness accounts. These are all, this story is um, entirely predicated on 
uh, those who wrote Islamic history. Um, well, we do know that in Malastu's case, with, there is evidence for this. Um, I mean, we take this, we take the, the general outlines of the story as accurate because we we know that the, the Umayyad uh, Amirate was established mm. at this time in, in 756 in Al-Andalus under his authority. So he's a real person. Uh, he does arrive in Iberia and uh, does become the emir and establishes uh, this Umayyad rule in Al-Andalus, which lasts really until the early, uh, really until the turn of the uh, the 1000s. So that's real. Um, I mean, we have uh, sufficient historical chronicles and coins and inscriptions and so on. Mm. We have the establishment of the great mosque of Cordoba mm. during the during his rule, which is it still is later today. By the way, it's a, just a church, right? Well, it's it's. I I think that's a bit of a misnomer. Um, it's a shame that we can't so, show slides, but. Uh, one of the great wonders of the medieval world uh, is this great mosque of Cordoba, which still stands in old Cordoba. It's only the interior, a, a portion, a small portion of the interior section, which was turned into a Gothic cathedral uh, later on in the Middle Ages after, uh, during, at, during one of the high points of the Reconquista. Uh, the, re the what what Christians what Christendom calls the reconquest of well they call it the reconquest of Spain, but the Christians re uh, uh, retook Cordoba in 1236 uh, under Castilian rule, and thereafter created this uh, this cathedral inside. But if you go in today, that only occupies a very small space. They uh, had the good sense that you had this architectural and artistic jewel. And so they left it mostly untouched. And so what you see today is, uh, is exactly the sort of mixing, melding, overlapping of the Christians in Spain with the Muslims mm -hmm. in Spain symbolized by this building. Mm -hmm. um, you can see the Islam influence even when you look at photos of that there is clearly this used to be a mosque, you can clearly see the architecture there. Yeah, I mean that the, the parts that were a mosque, they're they're left untouched. Um you can still feel it as a mosque. Um it's not used as a mosque, um, and that's a matter of contention too. Um, but uh that that's for you know the Spanish government and the Spanish uh, cultural movies, but Muslims uh, like to visit, um, as, as do people of other backgrounds, to see you know this this relic of of the past, um, and and what it signifies. Um, so but we see we see what what you called um, the influence of Islamic art and architecture, even after. Um, uh, Castile reconquers uh, Cordoba in 1236 and then Seville in 12, 1248. And at that point, all that's left of Islamic Spain is the city-state of Granada in the south. Mm. And that continues to exist for about another 250 years. But this, uh, this, this wasn't I, quite new for even with the Reconquista or that it turned the turned into the church. It's been done basically since the dawn of Muslim, birth of Muslim civilization, right? When they, they, they conquered the Constantinople in 1453, the Hagia Sophia was turned into a mosque, and then this has been done back and forth wherever they con reconquest, that this was turned into a mosque here, and this was turned into a church there, right? That's, this wasn't anything new, put it right. that way. And in fact, it's not even new uh, by the time we get to early Christianity, and certainly not by the time we get to early Islam. The practice of peoples throughout the Near East and the Mediterranean and Europe arriving on holy sites and then turning sites that had been holy to the culture and religion that preceded them 
they continue to view them as holy sites. They just reestablish them as holy sites for their religion and culture. Um, this predates Christianity. Uh, it, it goes back to the ancient Near East. So you're quite right. This is totally normal uh, social religious process. But what was like under Umayyad rule? And you, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, but your internet was falling a little out when, when you were talking about it. But you, you said that they didn't want to be called caliphate just yet in the early years because of, it would try to piss off the Abbasid caliphate and the Fatimids uh, who would right. come later. But they were emirate at the time. So what would be the, first of all, what would be the difference between an emirate and a caliphate? And okay, so when, an emirate, what was the rule like under Umayyad caliphate, Umayyad rule? So first, as an emirate, technically speaking, it's still part of the Abbasid caliphate, but that's uh, a kind of a pious fiction because uh, under the emirs, the Umayyad emirs, Al-Andalus is ruling itself. It's not answerable to Baghdad. Mm. On the other hand, Al-Andalus under the Umayyads, even before it becomes a caliphate, is still thinks of itself as part of the Islamic world. So if you're a Muslim or a Christian or a Jew, you, your passport to travel anywhere within the Islamic world is just your tax receipt. So as long as you paid your taxes, you're free to come and go any place. It's not like you're crossing some kind of a boundary. Now, by the... You know, it was by, basically like the EU today, right? Uh, yes, yes, but, I mean, I, I, I want to give a but. There, there's something to what you're saying, certainly commercially and intellectually, uh, and in terms of travel, exactly like the EU, and uh, I mean, in a medieval kind of way. Mm. But the one difference is that by the 10th century, you have the Fatimid Caliph in North Africa centered in Egypt, and then, you know, in Syro Palestine. You have the Abbasid Caliphate in the East. And it's at this point that the Umayyads decide well, you know what? You know, the Islamic world now is not one state, it's going to, and it's two states. Why not make three states? Mm. So a, a, a caliphate, as opposed to an emirate, which is kind of like a subdivision, uh, quasi-independent, but in, in, in form, but in fact, actually already independent. But now you have the rivalry of three caliphates, each claiming legitimacy. Mm. Um, and for a long time, historians thought that the Umayyads were remembering the rivalry between the Umayyads and the Abbasids going back to the eighth century mm -hmm. in the East, that the reason for this declaration of a caliphate in Cordoba was because of the Abbasids. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, only a small part of it. It's really more a rivalry with the Fatimids in North Africa and Egypt. So, uh, and there are tensions, military and political between the Umayyads in, in Al-Andalus and the Fatimids in North Africa and Egypt. And so 10th century, the Umayyads say, you know, we're now a completely independent state and um, with all of the bells and whistles that go with that. Um, but, but I thought that, I'm sorry for interrupting you briefly again, but I thought that just to be a child if you needed the basic was to have Mecca and Medina, right? But that they were way far way far away from Mecca and Medina. So how come they were allowed to call themselves a caliphate? Well, already under the Umayyads, the calif the caliphate was transferred from Medina to Damascus in the seventh century. So this was not, you know, this was not uh the first time that, you know, another capital uh, had a uh, witnessed the declaration of a caliphate. So first you have Medina uh, in the, in as as the political seat of the Islamic government. It's then transferred to Damascus, one of the great cities of the Near East, and then further east to Baghdad under the Abbasids, 
But you also have this great city in North Africa called Cairo. You have two other really important cities called Kairouan in present-day Tunisia and Fez in present-day Morocco. And you have this great city in Islamic Spain uh, called Cordoba and Sevilla. So these are natural places to predicate, uh, to establish political authority. And that's distinct from religious authority. Hmm. Uh, Mecca and Medina are holy places in ways that Damascus, Cairo, uh, Baghdad, Cordoba are not. Hmm. They have some religious significance attached to them in Islam, but nothing compared to Mecca and Medina. So here you see a difference in terms of religious sites, holy places, and, and places of political, economic, social significance in Islamdom. We talk about Islamdom mm. as opposed to Islam, a religion. Islamdom, a kind of a parallel to our use of the word Christendom. Mm. So we have to move on, I'm afraid. You talked a little bit about the literacy, how they, but there, it wasn't just Arabs who, would come to Cordoba to find it literary. And I said, we said this after recording as well, and I said this in the Fall of the Abbasid episode, that I find, find it really fascinating how the Islamic world, Al-Andalus, would have a golden age in literacy, while the Abbasids would have a golden age of science. That's really, that's super fascinating to me. Yes, and both of these are dependent upon or sort of uh, the results of socioeconomic uh, strength mm. um, that um, in order to afford a class of people who devote themselves to intellectual pursuits, um, you have to have, uh, you know, and institutions with major libraries in, in Cairo, in, in Baghdad, in Cordoba, um, classes of people who have the time and the resources someone is is paying for their education. So you have a budding of the Islamic sciences, uh, study of the Quran, the traditions of the prophet, Islamic law, but in uh, the Arabic language. In addition to that, all of the other things that benefit society, first and foremost, science mm -hmm. and theology, and philosophy, and uh, for the educated classes, poetry, music, um, the fine arts, uh, architecture, uh, and the like. Something I, would like so something I would like to add as well is that where, unlike Christendom, Islamic world did welcome scholars and intellectual, they didn't, weren't thrown upon unlike medieval Europe and Christendom at the time, they welcomed intellectuals. Well, it wasn't, the difference is that it was not just the repository of the church. Learning uh, is the repository of the church in Christendom of that period, um, of the parallel period. And one, um, the, the intellectual classes are, are, are more varied, I guess, and uh, the nature of intellectual pursuit is, is more varied as well. Um, and um, the institutions are more substantial and accommodate more people who are drawn to intellectual endeavor. Mm -hmm. And so you have a parallel happening in the Jewish community and we have, it, it, I guess, less evidence of a parallel happening among uh, Christians in Islamic Spain, but they're certainly in the cities uh, by 1,000 totally Arabized and um, totally uh, involved in uh, government offices, in economic activity, um, and, and the like. So we had it. Well, well, when you mentioned that the Umayyad would fall eventually in the early thousands, so what, what caused the fall of the Umayyads and who would take over after the fall of the Umayyad rule in Al-Andalus? So uh, 
let me just give some periodization mm, yeah. um, to help uh, your listeners. So we generally talk about the period from 711 to 929 as the pre-caliphal period, and then 929 to around 100, uh, 1006, sometimes uh, 1029, 1031, you have some leeway there uh, as being the period of the Umayyad Caliphate in Al-Andalus. And then uh, the 11th century or most of the 11th century up until around 1090 as the period of the party kingdoms. So the Umayyad Caliphate breaks up. Uh, it's still Al-Andalus, but uh, the sort of the date of the beginning of what later would be called the Reconquista, uh, Castile and Aragon are becoming more powerful. They're opening themselves up to learning. Um, uh, and Toledo, which is almost dead center in the middle of the Iberian Peninsula, is uh, falls to Alfonso the Sixth of um, of Castile in 1085, and so the map of Al Andalus begins to shrink from that moment on. Mm. Um, and what what ha what happened early in the 11th century is that a series of revolts by Berbers in Cordoba began to reflect a weakening of Umayyad rule or uh, contributed to a weakening of Umayyad rule. And so Al-Andalus breaks up into a series of city-states, Granada, Seville, uh, Zaragoza, Valencia. Um, and these city-states are culturally vibrant, but also rivals with one another, each led by its own emir or king or sultan, and each claiming to be the legitimate heir of Cordoba. Is this what causes the Reconquista to conquer so easily? I wouldn't say yeah. easily, but is this is this what causes the it's break a major of the contribution. Land? It's a major contribution to it. Now, the what later came to be called the Reconquista doesn't happen all at once. Yes, Toledo is conquered, but uh, Islam is still relatively strong in the rest of the southern half of the peninsula. But in the meantime, in North Africa, a succession of two Berber dynasties, first the Almoravids at the end of the 11th century, and then uh, the Almohads in the 12th century are... Uh, get drawn into, let's say, uh, the affairs of Al-Andalus and the interest of Andalusis in resist Muslims in resisting or pushing back the advance of Castile and Aragon. Mm -hmm. So Berber, so eventually Al-Andalus, what's left of Al-Andalus becomes incorporated into the Berber kingdoms ruled by the Almoravids and the Almohads from North Africa. So you have, you know, a, a, an Islamic country. Al-Andalus is now part of uh, the Maghreb, in a, the United Maghreb, uh, uh, with its capital either in Fez or Marrakesh. Um, and uh, for a time, the Almoravids and the Almohads succeed Christian advance. But eventually, in the 12th century, even the Almohads are overrun um, at Alarcos by, uh, by Castile. And so that then leads to the, what became the reconquest of most of the rest of Al-Andalus. I, I already cited 1236 in Cordoba and 1248 in Sevilla. And Islam, Al-Andalus contracts to the Nasrid kingdom of Granada, which is more than Granada, it's Granada and its environs. And because it pays tribute to the king of Castile for 200 years, Granada, the city-state of Granada continues to exist as the last outpost of Al-Andalus in Iberia. Something that we haven't mentioned in Eventually, the episode. 
I'm sorry, sorry I, I, I thought you were backed up a little bit, again, but I'm sorry for this, uh, interrupting you there. But something that we, and if I do, I should be wrong here, but something we did mention is that I believe Catalonia was never a part of Islamic Spain. Isn't that right? That it was never well, conquered? Well, uh, Catalonia was never part of, uh, Catalonia Ar it was Aragon. Mm. And so parts of it, Zaragoza say, and Valencia close by are parts of Islamic Spain. But, um, and, and Barcelona is as well, and, that's, uh, and that is Catalonia. Mm. But uh, that gives way earlier on. And uh, so uh, it, it's, it would be incorrect to say that not all uh, parts of Catalonia are part of Islamic Spain, mm. not all of it. Um, and something, and we don't have to take a look at the fall of Islamic Spain in a second, but I want to go back a little bit as well because somebody we haven't discussed, I feel like we have to discuss this as well, is the Vikings. Because as you know, they were first, they were, they were, while they were these first warriors and they conquered, and not necessarily, maybe not conquered, but they were robbing and pillaging. They also traded a lot with Islamic Spain. Yes. Islamic Spain, uh, I mean, it's during its heyday, especially, but even after its heyday, that was a one of the great trading centers of, of Europe. Um, and this is important because some scholars, uh, this, this notion is most closely associated with the writing of uh, my late colleague, Maria Rosa Menocal uh, of Yale and uh, her books. Um, um, and the idea, you know, to, to rid modernity of this idea that Islam was not very vibrant on the European continent for centuries, not for a brief period of time, but for centuries. It was economically vibrant. It was socially vibrant. It was culturally vibrant on the European continent for centuries. Um, and um, traded with, with everyone. There were no barriers to trade. So this is a model very, very typical uh, around the Mediterranean, I'd say. Um, it's, it's an Islamic model, but it's also not unique to Islam because uh, the Venetians were well known to be great traders and they would trade with anybody. It didn't matter what your religion was. If they were traders be... first and Christian them second, right? Exactly, exactly. Or maybe to put it a different way, religion did not get in the way of trade. Mm. Um, and so, um, you know, that, that was certainly true of Islamic Spain throughout its history. And we do have archaeological evidence here in Scandinavia as well that we do have Islamic coins yes. found in Viking graves. So that it wasn't just pillaging and plundering. They did. They did indeed trade trade with the Islamic world. Yes, there's a little bit of literary evidence for that too. But somebody I've mentioned him before as well. I don't know how well he's put in, into this particular guy, but there's a in the in the first crusade, there was a guy named Sigurd Yusufar. He was a Norwegian king. He did go on a crusade, and he did broke by the is is Al Andalus, and he did did ravage some some there. He wasn't necessarily trade, but he did. There is evidence that he was in Islamic Spain as well. I believe so. You, the connection that you're making there is probably important for your listeners because um, it's it's doubtlessly significant for later history writing, looking back on this period at the end of the 11th century. Mm -hmm. So we date the Crusades roughly from 1099, uh, the first crusade. Mm -hmm. And um, they go on for several centuries, but it's not a coincidence viewed later that the beginnings of what came to be called the Reconquista mm -hmm. in Iberia roughly coincide with the Crusades. Mm -hmm. So this idea of Christendom taking the battle to the Muslims, both in Iberia, but also in uh, in the Holy Land, uh, connects 
the Reconquista to the Crusades, mm. kind of retroactively. Mm. And it becomes, it, it comes to be looked at or called a part and parcel of the goals of the Crusades, although specific to Iberia. Mm. And let's talk about the after the Reconquista and uh, talking about how conversion of Muslims and the Spanish Inquisition. Could you um, could you expect the Spanish Inquisition? So, um, you know, the Inquisition obviously is one of these buzzwords too. It people it conjures certain images, even for people who don't know much history or don't. Mm -hmm know much specifically about it. It has the notion of it, that it was cruel. And you, of course, thought that Mother, Mother Python sketch made the way, way back. But, but for our purposes in talking about Muslims, Christians, and Jews in medieval Liberia, what's important is that um, it becomes a tool of increasing hostility on the part of the church towards religious minorities living in Christian lands, in Castile, Leon, Aragon. Um, and it's used as a weapon um, to uh, convert, or it got, I should put it this way, it goes hand in hand with an, an increasing effort not to tolerate a Jewish minority in Christian Spain, in the, the Christian kingdoms of Spain, not to tolerate the uh, Muslim minority in Christian Spain, but to uh, forcibly convert or encourage them to leave the country. But conversion and, and a re the reverse process that some Jews and some Muslims undoubtedly gave up and said, you know, uh, this is my home. I want to continue living here. I don't want to be persecuted. I don't want to leave. I'll, I'll just convert. And so you have a, 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 a certain percentage of, of people just doing that out of convenience or out of fear. Others leaving the land, others uh, converting out of persecution, and others just trying to hold fast to their religious traditions. You do have, uh, as, you do have evidence where they ha have to practice in secret for centuries, even after the... the well, the right. So as these pressures to convert increase, you have many, many more uh, either forcibly converted or, or, or secretly or converting, but insincerely. And so you have two, you have a parallel group of Muslims and Jews. You have uh, moriscos, which was the word that the Spanish Christians used to describe uh, secret Muslims or people they suspected of being secret Muslims. And you have the conversos among the Jews. So people who either genuinely converted or converted, but insincerely converted. Mm. But this creates a problem for the Christians. And this is where the Inquisition comes in. If you believe that society, Christian society now has these thousands of people who are still secretly Muslims or still secretly Jews, they are going to subvert the church from the inside, not from the outside. So you've got to get to the truth. And so the whole inquisition, these tribunals all across uh, the Christian kingdoms are used in order to ferret out secret Muslims, secret Jews, insincere Catholics, um, and torture is used and, and, and so on. More people leave the country. In fact, as far as the Jews are going, you have a series of attacks against all of the Jewish communities in Castile from 1391 to 1492. This culminates in 1492 when uh, Ferdinand and Isabel do away with Islamic Granada, uh, the Jews have first three months and then six months to leave the country completely, um, which they ultimately do. You referenced that earlier, many going to Ottoman mm. lands, some going to, uh, to uh, Amsterdam, others going to the New World, others going to North Africa. Um, and uh, Muslims also leaving, mostly going to North Africa. Um, 
and uh, but others st staying and secretly practicing uh, Islam uh, uh, underground, as with the conversos. Uh, and um, the Muslims then, for there, we have some uprisings among the Moriscos in the 16th century. Um, and then finally in 1609, Islam is, ba is banned, mm. uh, even among the secret Muslims. And so from that point on, uh, we don't, at least in theory, have any more Moriscos. Mm. Um, no, I mean, we talked about the great mosque of, Cor of Cordoba and how it's just a fraction of it still remaining. But is there more evidence from from the Islamic world, if you in other cities and in Cordoba itself, or in Spain, from Al Andalus today, that we, if you want to go to see Spain and you want to see some of Al Andalus, is there well, you where see, should you go? Uh, all all throughout um, the south of the, of the country, and in Portugal, you see architectural remains and evidence. Um, there's an architectural. Uh, presentation now and reconstruction of the Umayyad uh, caliphs palaces mm. in you know five uh, meters outside uh, kilometers outside of Cordoba um, that people can go and visit there are remnants of things in Seville if you go to the cathedral of Seville you can look at the the bell tower it's called La Giralda you can look at the bell tower and you can see sort of the stages in which it was built. And you can see that about two thirds of the way up the bell tower, uh, it actually was once the minaret of the great mosque of Seville before it was turned into a bell tower for the cathedral after the conquest of Seville in 1248. Similarly, the courtyard uh, of the cathedral today um, is a courtyard that was once the courtyard of the mosque and you that's still intact and you can see its relationship to the mosque and it was the place where there would be an overflow overflow of people uh looking to worship in the mosque and also the place where muslims would do their ablutions before going in the mosque all of that is still visible today and a I, lot of other sites I do believe that there was some Muslims who wanted to pray inside the church, inside the mosque, but they were dragged away by police forces and forbidden to pray in the mosque. Not not too long ago, actually, I think this happened. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I don't know about that case, but it, it doesn't surprise me. Although, um, you know, because of the presence of so many crucifixes and images of Christ in uh, in that church, unlike, say, the, the majority parts of the great mosque of Cordoba, La Mesquita now, um, I, I don't know where a Muslim could pray without, because everywhere you look, you see icons. Um, so I don't know where it would be halal, which means um, kosher for Muslims to pray. Thank you so much for coming on this podcast. It was a pleasure to have you on. Before you pleasure. go, the do you have anything you want to promote? Where can people buy your books? Should they be interested in reading more about Al Andalus? Uh, sure. The, those two books I mentioned, um, um, the, the um, Maria Menocal's book, "The Ornament of the World," uh, is uh, a for a, a general reading audience and is probably the best introduction to what we've been talking about today. I would recommend that highly, and she has a bibliography there for more specialized studies, say, if you're interested in military history or cultural history or social and economic history, mm -hmm. religious history, whatever you might want to do. But where do people find your books if they want to read what you, your uh, books? You, on on, on uh, Amazon uh, or in um, other ways, Barnes & Noble, other ways of ordering directly from the publishers is probably the best way if you want discounts. Mm. The Power and the Portrayal is available in paperback. Um, both those two books, uh, my other books, I, I think are, are are too specific to other related themes, but too specific. And so I'm not recommending them here, but um, uh, both of these books are also available as eBooks from the publisher. 
um, for people who want to access them that way. Mm. But I, I highly recommend Menno Kyle's book. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast. We, this has been Well That H12. We are available on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, wherever you can find podcasts. If you do have the time, please consider writing a review on Apple Podcasts. That would help us out a lot. Please like, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.